I won't bother to introduce myself. I am notorious here. So, uh, you know, it, it's like I'm coming back like a spent penny. But I thought that since I was in Paris, it would be a good occasion again to come to Lynx and uh, spend half a day just chatting with people. So I decided to give the second talk. And the second talk is very different from the other talk that I gave because the other talk contained no randomness, no, no real models, but just a problem formulation of an optimization problem and what structural uh, results one could get with it. This is of course a more theoretical problem. And uh, you know, the main question is that there have been a number of studies that have gone on, on trying to find, uh, I mean, to, to understand these mean field approximations uh, uh, mean field approximations for understanding randomized routing. So of course, there are many questions that are left open that most models try to analyze what are called homogeneous systems where everything is nice. Uh, and what happened and, and very few have dealt with heterogeneous models. But the second question, of course, that has largely uh, only come to the fore now is the question of how good are these approaches to really predict performance? So that's going to be, in fact, the topic of my talk today. And I think I have to wait. How do I do it here? Okay. Yeah. yeah, just click on it. So what I'm going to talk about is the general problem of randomized load balancing. And for those of you who are just tuning into this stuff, I will just give you some background of why. Uh, this has become an important field of study. And then I will talk about the fact. I believe they don't get the new version. Oh, they don't. So res okay. resume share. Yeah. Is it working? How do you click on this? So hmm? much? No. Because you see that I always see the first yes. page. Uh, now, no. Bring your shared window to the front, but what is your shared window? Let's see, bring it to the front. Okay. Okay. Make, make, it, make a new share. Make a new share, that means go up. Go up, go up. Go up. Stop share, new share. Yes. Stop share. Stop share. Okay. New share. Okay, now let's go back. It's there, yeah. Where is it? Uh, down, down. Just next to Firefox. Wow. Yes. Uh, share the world screen, desktop. Go for the desktop, upper left. Right. Now, You're sharing screen. So now, let us, yes, see. you can go full screen. You can do whatever you want now. Perfect. Well, okay. Samash. Okay. Okay. So the idea is. Uh, sorry, I didn't notice this computer over here. That's right. Okay. So uh, the idea is that I'm going to talk about what happens when systems become heterogeneous. And then I will come to the basic problem at hand in trying to understand how well do these mean field techniques work. And for that studying, I will talk about what is called the fluctuation process. It's really the, the error or the deviation from the mean field of the empirical measure. And, and then I'll talk about how we obtain these, uh, what are called functional central limit theorems. And finally, I will, ed I will end with uh, something that has been also studied a lot today, something called throughput and heavy traffic optimality. That means does the system behave? Do we, is there a price to be paid when using randomized algorithms? either in the normal regime or in a heavy traffic regime. So my motivation, of course, for studying these problems were problems arising, say, server farms, cloud computing, med media servers, where you have a large number of resources. And I'll just show you a picture of a typical server farm. And jobs need to be processed could be either retrieving a file or getting a job done if it's a cloud computing platform. And the idea is that if you have a large set of widespread set of resources, you would like to balance the loads amongst them 
because you would not like the processors to be very busy so that your sojourn in the system is going to be short. Okay. And so, of course, you can do this if you have all the information about the system and there is a price to be paid between how much information you have and uh, or how little information you require and what trade-offs on the performance you will get. But you see such randomized algorithms are used today in uh, by Google, Microsoft and Amazon. In fact, they use some uh, an algorithm which is what is called the power of two rule. You, you, you choose randomly select two and you choose whichever resource gives you the better performance. OK, which depends on what you're trying to do. And so the typical examples where we see this are in either infrastructure as a service uh, sort of platforms like Amazon EC2, Microsoft Azure, and also uh, uh, the, the Google, uh, you know, the, what's it called? The Google, uh, ah, the name is this thing. Um, it, it's also a platform to, to get jobs processed, okay? And so the cloud operator, what it says, it sells uh, com computing resources to its users in terms of virtual machines. And each sort of user is matched to some virtual machine. The virtual machine could be processor, memory, and 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 uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, so a, a random access memory or storage as attached to it. Uh, and a virtual machine request is at, at actually assigned to a physical machine. And what we know in all these systems is the server capacity is just shared amongst all the virtual machines that are assigned to these servers, okay? And the service provider, of course, aims at either reducing the average sojourn time or the time to execute the job on the system and or to reduce the possibility that you will not get a server, which is the blocking problem. And I won't talk about the blocking problem today, but although I have results on it. So this is typically, uh, a server from infrastructure that typically over 100,000 servers. And so for good system performance, a dispatcher who receives a job must know roughly what the servers and their loading is because you would ideally like to send the job to a server which is not loaded, very heavy, okay? And of course, if you have 100,000 servers, then you don't want to maintain the state of 100,000 servers. So you want to find an efficient mechanism to try to glean the information. And one of these techniques is a randomized sampling technique by which you sample servers, a finite number of them, and choose the best amongst them. And the question is, how well do these schemes behave? And so uh, the idea is to keep delay low. So this is the model I'm going to consider. I'm going to consider a model in which Arrivals come as Poisson. I'm just there are n number of servers. Okay. So here they are C1 to C N, but I'm thinking of this N servers being split into M subgroups, where the subgroups could reflect the speeds of the servers. Okay. And with just uh, the fact that C1 is uh, slower than C2 and CM, which is the largest, uh, which is the highest index, is the fastest server. And what we will assume is that the N servers, gamma I N servers of type I are present. And the summation gamma I is just one. So it's just, the so gamma A is the fraction of the servers of type CI amongst N. And uh, so an incoming job is sent to a job dispatcher, which decides which server to send it to. So it comes here. So what this job dispatcher does, in this case where it's two, it selects these two servers just by random. And it sends the job to the server, which is the least loaded. So the least loaded could be in terms of the number of jobs a server is concurrently processing. If, for example, we are in a round robin scheme, or so that means how many virtual queues are there, or it could be the number of jobs waiting in the queue, or if it's a loss system, 
it is the number of empty spaces available in the system. Okay, so it could be very different. And the the thing I'm going to analyze is something which uh, sorry, which has become very popular called join below threshold policy. It is first is what you do is you sample. Okay, now in this sample, if there are servers with the number of jobs that they are being that are being processed by those servers, which is smaller than a certain threshold, choose any of those servers randomly, uniformly. If not, you choose to the server and send it to a server where the number of jobs being processed divided by the server speed is the smallest, because what it says is that you're going to get more server capacity and therefore you will get out faster. OK, so this is and for simplicity, we just take these these thresholds alpha J, which are the 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 thresholds for the join below the threshold for the different types such that there are some constants. So alpha div, alpha J divided by CJ is a constant just for simplicity. Okay. And of course, if alpha J is zero, then you come back to what is called the normal join the shortest queue, in which case you are sampling queues and you're sending it to the queue with the smallest ratio of X by C. And why do you have to take X by C? Because the servers are heterogeneous. And so the actual speed of service that you receive matters. If of course the servers were identical, then you just send it to a join in the shortest queue. Okay. So yeah, mm. this path, sometimes it's a subset of the servers or just a destination of the states of the servers. It, it is just a subset of servers that you choose. Okay. Just like a subset. Like of to choose this. Huh? Yeah. Okay. So JSQD is you select subset D of servers and join to the job to the least loaded server. And what we know if D is equal to one, it's your, let's take the home is you're choosing uniformly or you're choosing a server of type I with the probability gamma I because gamma I is the ratio is a fraction of servers that have service rate I. And then what one can show is that because of Poisson thinning, you get, uh, you know, process sharing queues with rate lambda times gamma i. And therefore, the tail distribution is just rho i raised to n, where rho i is lambda gamma i divided by the service rate, which is uh, ci. Okay? So that's rho i. And of course, I put E of sigma. We can take E of sigma to be equal to one, which will make all the jobs be of unit length. Now, what happens is that if you sample two at random, then it's called the SQD scheme or JSQD scheme. This is also referred to when D is equal to two as the power of two schemes. And if all the servers were identical, then one could show that the tail distribution goes as rho of d which is 2 raised to n right so suddenly from a rho raised to n type of decay of the tail it becomes rho raised to 2 raised to n type of decay and so it becomes super exponential and very fast and of course therefore the uh, if you use little's law you, the delay becomes much lower much much lower and in fact what one can show or this is what actually the work of Michael Mitzelmacher was in his thesis, was to really show that if you choose D equals two, you get most of the advantage and it's very close to the optimal thing. The optimal thing is, of course, if it would have been if you had chosen join the shortest queue, which is D equal to N. That is choose amongst the shortest servers. Okay. So just I'll give you some background of these results, a little bit of more mathematical. For, so we can show that for any D, the stability condition, which is also called the maximum or the throughput optimality region is just rho less than one, okay? So the stability region does not change if everything is homogeneous. So rho less than one is the stability region for such systems. And what we would, since we are talking about systems that have 100,000 servers, we are really interested in the situation where n is large. And this is very difficult to analyze, say in a join the shortest queue, because the fact that you're choosing and comparing, you introduce dependency. 
and it's very hard to analyze. If you take the join the shortest queue, explicit results are only known in the case of two. Even the case of three, we don't have in, in, the, in the very simple context of Poisson arrivals and exponential service times. So what we try to do is we uh, try to approximate the stationary distribution of this quantity where n is finite as t tends to infinity by first taking the limit as n tends to infinity and then looking at the stationary distribution of that limiting system with an infinite number of servers. Okay. In other words, hopefully this whole procedure makes sense and it would make sense if we could interchange these two limits. But then if we can do that, we would like to know how good would such an approximation be to, to pi n of infinity. Right? This is what we want to really know. Whether our techniques that we develop, they may be nice mathematically, but how good are they? And, and so uh, just to go now, what Vedanskaya and Dobrushin proved in 1996 and also Mixon Marker and Carl Graham says that if you look at the tail distribution, if you look at the tail distribution PK, you get this super exponential DK, but you get something else. If you pick any finite number of servers and look at their joint distributions or look at those processes, then those servers behave as if they are statistically independent. In other words, for any finite number of servers, you get a product of their individual distributions. Okay. So, in fact, Graham in his work in, in uh, uh, the Journal of Applied Probability in 2000 actually showed something more, which he called chaotic key on path space, which says that suppose you start those cues either from a deterministic situation or from initial conditions that are in mutually independent, then the queuing processes will, will, will evolve in an independent manner for all t. And that's what he called chaoticity in part space. Okay, so that's what he showed. So what Vedanskaya and Dobrushin showed was that this product probability was only there in the limit. What Graham really did was to show it actually held in part space as well. So the summary of the results is that we have an empirical distribution. So let X and T be the empirical distribution, which is the fraction of the queues in the system, which have say X N of T greater than N, greater than or equal to N customers. We first looked at as N tend to infinity. And I said, this is called the mean field limit. And it turns out it converges to a process, which is a deterministic process. And then we study the deterministic process and we try to see whether it converges to something. Suppose it converges to P. Is this P the same as first taking the limit of looking at the stationary version of this process and then taking its limit as n tends to infinity? And of course, if this diagram if commutes along either path, then you have what is called uh, both propagation of chaos taking place and you have uh, and, and you have the ability that you can isolate a single queue and you can analyze it in isolation because it's statistically independent from the other and and, and so that's one of the great advantages and of course what happens is when the queues are mm1 and when you use join the shortest queue and you look at its mean free limit in in that case this entire uh, commutative uh, diagram holds. And, and, and the reason it turns out is that the P, which is called the fixed point, this is the equilibrium point of the mean field, turns out to be unique. And, 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 and it turns out to be unique. And the uniqueness then tells you that by Prohorov's theorem, it must be the limit this way too. And so, one can show that any fixed point of U of T must be an equal, a stationary distribution for Xn. And since there is only one unique one, it is what those convergences happen. And because of that, Prokhorov's theorem really tells you that you have this convergence, okay? So now let's come to the model that I want to discuss today. 
you have large number of servers, capacity to process a maximum of, uh, not C jobs, but CJ, if it is of type J. Jobs arrive according to Poisson process with rate N lambda, and let jobs IID exponential with mean one by mu, and let's take mu to be one. And a job arriving to a server begins service immediately at rate CJ divided by X, where X is the number of jobs at server. So this is what a processor sharing does. Okay. And so the routing scheme, if it's JSQ or uh, join below threshold is sample D servers. Servers are processor sharing. For all servers that are below a given threshold for type J, so if it's server type I, it's alpha I, choose uniformly at random amongst those servers. If not, choose the server with the lowest X divided by C, which is the largest C divided by X. And ties are always broken by picking a faster server. And, we, and I said that we have C1 servers of type one, C2 of type two, CM of type M, and we have ordered them that C1 is the slowest and CM is the fastest. And so now, Let's talk about this notion of throughput optimality. Well, as, like we said, what is the average service rate offered by the system? If mu is one, it is just summation one to m gamma j cj. This is the average capacity, right, of the system. And so the throughput optimal situation is that such systems are stable as long as lambda belongs to this region. Because you have n lambda coming to outside system, and this is the total capacity which is allocated in the system, which is gamma j cj. So is it mu equal to some? Mu is just the service time. Uh, oh, yeah, one yeah, by mu yeah. is the average service time. Okay, and and so what you have is this is your throughput optimal region. So that means the system can support any arrival rate lambda in this region, lambda star. And what one can show is that if the system is homogeneous, that means all the servers have the same speed, then both join below the threshold and join the shortest queue sampling D at a time are throughput optimal schemes. In other words, one doesn't lose any of the stability. Okay. Now, what happened in the heterogeneous system? So I'm just scaling it along rays. So I'm let n star be the smallest integer that gamma j n star is an integer okay. Okay. for all j so and let's look at the scaling n equal to k n star right so i'm looking at the scaling so this is the total number of servers is capital n now if i define lambda k right as the stability region for the system, when n is equal to k n star, right, one can show that lambda star, which was my previous throughput maximal region, strictly contains this region as k goes from 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So the larger the size of the system, lambda star is contained, and if and if I call lambda infinity to be the intersection of all these spaces, uh, lambda k, then we can identify what lambda infinity is for such system. And so what it says that in general, in general, if you, if you sample, you see, remember here, this set I is your sampling set, J is the set of servers, okay? So, what you're saying is you're sampling D servers and you want to compute this minimum over all those quantity because that is going to define the constraints of your stability region, right? And what it says is that if you just pick D servers at random and the servers are heterogeneous and you don't account for the heterogeneity, then in fact, the region in which your stability occurs can be diminished from the optimal optimal region okay and lambda infinity is just therefore the region that can support all the possible sizes of the systems 
right? And in some sense, that is the stability region if you want your mean field techniques to work. And so what it says is in heterogeneous systems, suddenly you have lost stability just because you're not taking into account heterogeneity. Okay. So now, of course, there's a question. Can we achieve maximal stability with a fixed sampling scheme? And the answer is, of course, yes. Suppose I look at the sampling set I, okay? And the sampling set always contains servers of each type, right? So it contains servers of every type. Then clearly what happens is that this denominator, since J is contained in that sampling set, this denominator becomes one. And this is just summation gamma J C J, which is the normal stability condition, and you recover the global stability region. So what it says, your sampling set must try to sample all the servers. And so the simplest scheme is the following. Is that suppose you think of these servers being heterogeneous servers, but located physically different places. So you say location A has all servers which are provided by, let's say, vendor A have certain types of memory and so on. Location B has all servers which are offered slightly different types, slightly different speeds, different cores and so on. So it says from each one of those sample a different number. And the simplest one is to sample one from each. That will give D summation DJ equal to M. So if you have a sample size of at least M, it is possible to recover stability of the system. Okay, it should be of size M. And in this scheme, of course, I'm assuming that I sample only one from each one of them and compare. But that's enough to get you all the gains. So the question that I would like to address in the rest of the talk is how well does the mean field track the empirical distribution of the system? That means I would like to compute the tail distribution for n when it's a fi finite size. And this pi kd is the distribution or the fixed point of the mean field. I want to compute this as a function of n and find out how close these two are. What is the error of the order of? Can we characterize it? Because then I can say, that instead of this quantity, if n, if the error is small, I uh, replace it and approximate it by the mean field, and then the mean field is going to give you the prediction. So one of the things I'm going to show, and this is where the talk will lead up to, is that if I try to compute delay in these heterogeneous systems using the mean field, my error is of the order of one by square root n. And I can exactly characterize what they, are, what they are, okay? So what are the key challenges? Not P, uh, so, so, so PK. So the key is even when N is equal to infinity in heterogeneous systems, we do not have a characterization of the tail distribution, okay? Explicit characterization. So you have to work in a very different way to get your limit theorems. And it turns out that if n is infinity, the system becomes reversible, but if n is finite, the system is not reversible as a Markov process. And so these are the big challenges that we have to deal with. So just let's set up the mathematical model. Let's define two spaces. So the first space is U, which is a set of all decreasing sequences, right? So this, in some sense, is the space in which tail distributions are going to live. U naught is equal to one. U one is greater than is smaller than U U naught, and so on and so forth. So it's a decreasing sequence. So this is the this is the space in which tail distributions live, and V is the space where, in some sense, it's just the space of all sequences in R. Okay, these two quantities we need, and of course we work with L two norm, and sometimes we work with L one. And let me call X NJN 
as the fraction of type J servers that have at least n jobs at time t. Right. So this is in some sense, I just count the number of servers of type J, which have at least n jobs. It's a fraction of those servers. Okay. okay. So now the first theorem is what the mean field looks like in this case. It turns out that the process Xn, which is this empirical process which counts for the fraction of servers that have a given number of jobs, at least a given number of jobs, the tail distribution, converges to this differential equation. And this differential equation is given by these, this function for various values of j. What does this expression really mean? We'll see very shortly. This is nothing but the generator of the Markov process at uh, x, right? So it's, it's a mark. It's a nonlinear Markov process, and so it is a function of the Markov process at x. And why does it depend on x? Because it depends on the sampling. Because I'm going to compare my q to the other q's, and I'm going to go to this a particular server if and only if my x by c is smaller than the other x by c's. And so the next thing is what can we say about this mean field in this heterogeneous case? So let P denote the fixed or equilibrium point of the mean field equation, this equation number seven. Then what we know is that if the allowable rate belongs to lambda star, Right, it, it should have been lambda star, which is the global stability region of the system. Then, of course, the limit of the mean field equation is exactly p. In other words, f of p equal to zero has a unique solution, and moreover, this convergence is exponential. And so, what this really means is from Prokhorov's theorem is that the limit n limit you can interchange the limits, and they are the same. It's equal to p. And moreover, it shows that every single server will converge to this its stationary distribution. Okay. And the servers become independent. So you get all the you get all the conclusions of uh, the mean field analysis. And of course, the key is, of course, is that this point P turns out to be the global asymptotic stable point of this flow f of xt okay so now what i'm going to do is let's define the fluctuation process which is square root of n gamma j because that's the number of servers of type j n gamma j so square root n gamma j of the empirical process or the empirical distribution of the j type servers from which the mean field is subtracted so little xj is the mean field, right? So this measures the deviation between the two. And, and so, first of all, you realize that this process ZNT sits in the space V because Z is really a, a vector, right? Of N, N plus one, N, N, N plus one, N plus two, and so on. And XNT, of course, sits in the space U as does XJ. Because these are all probabilities, tail distributions. So the first thing is let's try to see how does the X process develop. So let's def define uh, the probabilistic evolution of the processor sharing Q. And for that, it's just at any time T, the initial condition plus the number of arrivals. So this is just a Poisson process with this intensity. And you have a departure process, which is another Poisson process with this intensity, right? So this is just the X N J S minus X N plus one J. You can think of it as the probability of being in state N, because since these are tail distributions, the, the difference between the two is just the probability of being in state N. So this is the number of departures in state N over zero to T. So this is how the 
process evolves. And why do we write it like this? The reason is, of course, what with respect to this Poisson processes N and this Poisson process D, we're going to write martingales. And we're trying to, going to try to use martingale limit theorems. So now let me define three generators which correspond to, in some sense, the rates, whether it's below alpha j or greater than alpha j, and the departure rates. Okay. And I, I define this as sort, sort of weighted quantity of W1. Okay. Right. So I, I define these three operators as functions of U. So they are operators functions for U, and they are mappings from U to V. And again, let W be W1 minus W2, and Wj be W1j minus W2j for each j. And I'm not going to get into anything, but it, it turns out that they're all Lipschitz. Why do we need Lipschitzness? We will see very shortly. So now, if we look at the fluctuation process, which is Zn, which is square root n gamma j into the empirical distribution of x minus the mean field, we can show that it satisfies an equation like this. So you have a process whose drifts are given by the Wj's, right? And then you have a martingale term. And the martingale terms are coming from those point processes. And you can calculate exactly the quadratic variation of the martingale, which is this quantity. And you can show that it's square integrable with respect to uh, little l2. And so now let us look at LU of W, which is the linearization of the mean field equation at a point view al along a mean field trajectory U. Well, we can write this this way. Okay, I won't bother you with all these expressions, but they are basically two terms. One, whether it's below alpha or greater than alpha and one for the departure process. Right. So it's, it's, so it's, it's related to that. And now let's consider the stochastic differential equation whose drift is given by this operator L X. So this is the, if you think of it, it is the fresh air derivative of the, of the uh, uh, mean field evaluated at X. So let's look at this differential equation. Then this differential equation is, not, is nothing but a linear differential equation in Z plus a Gaussian martingale. So this is just an equation this way. Then such a process is nothing but an Einstein-Ullenbeck process. And this Einstein-Ullenbeck process is going to play a very important role in our limit theorem. So the first thing we know about what that equation is because of all the Lipschitz continuity and the square integrality of the martingale and so on. This differential equation has what is called a unique strong solution. And moreover, if the initial condition Zn converges to zero, I mean, to, to, to a fixed point, Z zero, then the process of the process of the empirical distributions will converge to this process Zt, which is the solution of this onsen. That means, in other words, the fluctuation process that I define is going to converge to an onsen ullenbeck process as n goes to infinity. And it's this Einstein and Beck process that's going to give us our results. So this happens for any t that is finite. What happens when you have t at infinity? This result doesn't carry through because the space is no more compact, right? Because it's from zero to t, which is a compact space. So you have to give a slightly different argument. And so you have to look at x and t minus the fixed point of the mean field now and look at this limit and you get the same type of thing that you get convergence to the invariant law the law of your um, 
fluctuation process goes to the invariant law of that or the stationary solution of that Ornstein Runeberg process. And therefore, once you have that, you're in position. So if I call EDN to be the delay in a finite system and ED to be the mean sojourn time of jobs in a system with infinite number of servers, that is the mean field limit, then it tells you that square root N times this just goes to a constant. The right hand side is a constant that does not depend on N, right? So what it says is that the, the accuracy between the, when you approximate EDN by ED is accurate up to order one by square root N. And this is to be expected since these convergences that I've talked about are really central limit theorems. So one by square root N is the level of convergence. But the key is that you can completely characterize all these uh, terms. And, and the uh, proof is very, very easy in the sense that if we know this is the average delay in the, in the system with finite n, and it's just this quantity. So we, we have these empirical measures. You have to take the expectation value of them. And so it just turns out to be this. But now we know that these two limits commute. And so if we take these two limits and we subtract p, then you get precisely this quantity nu j. And then you keep on doing your approximations and you get your required answer, which is E D N of D is E D plus that quantity divided by square root N. And you have a term which is little O of square root of N. Okay. So what it tells you is that these functional central limit theorems allow you to do a lot more. This is just, I've given a delay calculation, but you can do other things too. Okay. And so, I just want to relate these results to prior works. So Graham in 2005 tried to study MM1 type systems and looking at this fluctuation process, but of course in a homogeneous setting of the difference between the empirical measure and the mean field. And what he showed was of course the convergence to the ornstein ullenbeck process, but somehow he did not do the next step of using that result to calculate to characterize the accuracy of that approximation. Then in 2015, Lei Ying used Stein's approach, right? To look at the L2 distance between the stationary system and its mean field. And he showed that it's of the order of one by N. Okay. And uh, again, his results are not uh, uh, process-wise, but just in terms of convergence of those random variables. And finally, Gast showed that if you take any functional of this limiting process, and you take a function of pi, if H is Lipschitz, then also the error of O1 by N occurs, and he actually went and characterized what that O1 by N term is. And, uh, but again, uh, uh, they did it for homogeneous systems. And so I would like to end this question of this throughput optimality and heavy traffic optimality. And the question that I ha had asked in the beginning was, is there a finite D we can sample which doesn't which is agnostic of the type of servers, which will guarantee me a stability region that is maximum, right? In, in the scheme that I analyzed over here, just for simplicity, I took, I sampled D1 from type one, D2 of type two, D3 of type M, uh, three and, and DM of type M. So that was equivalent to sampling D1 plus D2 plus D3 plus DM. So if each of the Ds are one, it is at least I'm sampling M servers all the time, but that's because I know if I sample a server at location A, that server is likely to be different from a server at location B and so on and so forth. But if I did not know the locations or the types of servers, what types of servers were present at which location, 
then I would just sample D random servers. And the question is, can I do it? Can I get global asymptotic stability? So if you look, the stability region is just given by this. It's the row being less than one over all choices B, which are the sets which you sample in. Okay. And it says that the total service rate in all the B times lambda n times A, which is uh, the set A contains those subsets of B, which have exactly D samples. And it's looking at the max of this over all B and A, which of course can be written out this way. And so, if you use this expression, you can show that a sufficient condition being agnostic of the servers is just to know the ratio of CM by C1. That's the right. Huh? It's not right. It's not because, right. for instance, if D get two, let's say that you should have span up two, uh, the three is that so. So, right. So what I'm saying is that if CM, suppose there are five classes, okay, of servers. So this is five, and suppose CM is 1.5 C1 uh, and uh, or 1.5 times C1, then you take D to be two. Then sampling two servers at a time will give you global stability of the heterogeneous system. Okay. So that's that's what I'm trying to say. So if, but for example, if the fastest server is ten times as fast as server one. It just says sample five or, or sample three, which is the number of types of servers. Okay, so you can show that a sufficient condition is if D is greater than this, then you get what is called throughput optimality. Now there comes the question of something called heavy traffic optimality. What does heavy traffic optimality say? If I look at a system in heavy traffic, what I do is I add up all the total service available to me which is n times summation gamma ICI. This is the total rate of service that the system can provide. Right? And if lambda right, goes towards the sum that is close to one of the summation gamma ICI, then that system will give me the best performance in heavy traffic, right? because I've taken all the capacity and put it to one, and I've taken an input because all the queues are sort of going to be full, right? And so that is going to give me what is called a resource pool system whose total service is the total service in the system and the arrival is the total arrival rate, right? So I have to, so what people have uh, actually, Kelly and Laws showed that in many systems, right? With alternate routing and so on, this resource pooling effect took place in heavy traffic. In other words, what it says is that rather than con consider all the queuing processes of the n-dimensional object, it co all collapses onto a one-dimensional object, and that one-dimensional object evolves exactly according to a resource pool system with the total arrival rate n lambda and the total service rate n times summation gamma ICI. And so the question is, we have throughput optimality if D is greater than this, is it heavy traffic optimal? Remember, because we are sampling a finite number. And what we showed, at least in the case of loss systems, right, is that in some, uh, in, in some particular regime called a Halfinwit regime, is that even though every single subsystem is heavily loaded, the constant to which it converges is different from the constant of the resource pooled case. Okay, but it, but so you get uh, you get a state space collapse, but the state space collapse is not equal to the resource pooled system, and that's because D is finite. And so what Borst and all of these people did in work last year is they took the number of samples D to grow with the size of the system N. And they said that if D is at least log N or D is in fact some function G of N and G of N goes to infinity as N goes to infinity, in some sense, 
you will get the same as the uh, join the shortest queue system, which is a completely resource pooled system, right? So in that case, you have a heavy traffic optimality. But here, when you remain with finite samples, then what it forces you is forces you to pay a penalty, right? Because you you only go to the limit of join the shortest queue when n goes to infinity. When, when when the d the number of samples goes to the same order as the number of servers. So if D is finite, this cannot happen. So although ev every single queue will have row close to one, they will still not be in the uh, uh, Halfenwood regime. And so that's a very interesting uh, result for these type of systems. And with that, I'll end. And these are some of the references which are which are the key. So for example, in this paper, yeah, this paper uh, which is uh, to appear in June this time, we did this uh, whole analysis for Erlang loss models. And today, what I talked about is, uh, you know, for uh, processor shared systems, which just it's technically a little bit harder, right? And and in here, we we did the homogeneous case, and now of course we know how to do the the heterogeneous case. And, and so these are sort of other relevant uh, references for uh, these type of results where people try to study how accurate are mean field approximations. Okay, so with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Thanks, Ravi. Any questions? Uh, perhaps. Um, uh, so since you, you mentioned the paper of Vedenskaya and uh, Nikita uh, Vedenskaya and Rolando Bouchin, so what, uh, you, you mentioned initially the Mitz and Maher. So, I mean, this is about the same time, right? Right. So was it started independently or? Uh, they, claim, uh, so they claim, they claim it was independent. I see, okay, right. But if you look at the thesis of Mitz and Maher. Yes. You know, he, so, so, so like I said, one of the key results in this thing to get this sort of statistical independence is this global asymptotic stability of the fixed point. Yeah. Mitzen Marke gave a spurious argument in his paper mm -hmm. and his thesis. Mm -hmm. Vedanskaya and Dobrushin gave the correct argument. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in some, but Vedanskaya and Dobrushin did it for two Qs. Mitzen yeah. Marke did it for D. Ah, okay. Okay, yes. And they call it also power of two or something like yeah, that. Yeah, but, right? but, but Mitzan Makar did it for D and said, well, the most interesting case is when D is equal to two. Yeah, because you already get the, the tail uh, the tail behavior, I mean, uh, the improvement of the and tail. Then, of that. And then the problem that Mitzan Marker had was that in trying to show global stability of the fixed point, he used the Lyapunov function, which was a linear Lyapunov function. Okay. Mm. And his arguments there, are highly spurious. That means that there, there are no justifications given. Mm -hmm. And we know it's very hard to work with linear Lyapunov functions mm -hmm. for a uh, thing. But uh, Vedanskaya and Dobrushin did a beautiful thing. They really showed uh, the integral of the difference between the two distributions from zero to infinity was finite. Mm. Okay. And that automatically gave the convergence. Hmm. So, uh, so that was the basic difference. But otherwise, so so if one wants to read, then it's better to read Vedanskaya's paper, okay. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, and of course, I must say, uh, Carl Graham has done some very very nice work in all these areas. Uh, if, if I remember well, there was also a fair amount of work of uh, Yuri Surov with uh, James Martin. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, so Yuri, when, you know, they yes. also tried to do it. Yeah. So, so what they call fast Jackson networks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that was a famous paper, and then they did, in some sense, what they showed is a different. Is that the number of network nodes were going to infinity, and they proved a very similar result that you have statistical independence. Mm -hmm. If the output of every network can arbitrarily join with probabilities a finite number, right, at the output. And, and so uh, 
so in fact you know if he, when we that is when when arpan first did his work on mean field stuff our two basic references were vedanskaya's work karl i mean three karl graham's work on chaoticity and this paper by james martin and fuhoff on fast jackson networks so these were the key papers and i think of course after that it has become a a, a, a real production but you see what most people are doing today is they formally it's very easy to formally derive the mean field okay it is also often very easy to show that the mean field has a unique fixed point hmm. the hard thing is to show convergence towards this fixed point because only then only then do you get uh, this propagation of chaos or statistical independence and so if you look at the number of pieces of work on using mean fields they never established this so all the results do is remain just a formal approach to trying to solve the problem okay so yeah there so so i i mean i get you know i get so many papers to review on this stuff and every time i say you have not shown this you are just claiming this and they will come back and say no no it's very hard to show okay so 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 and 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 actually something very interesting that happens in these heterogeneous systems when you talk about this convergence right it's very strange things that happen that you know the, it actually goes up before going down so 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 the total variation distance actually increases before decreasing so there is no way you can get this monotonic convergence except in these particular models that i have talked about which are these process sharing models and and in fact for this i found there was some very very interesting work and it goes back to eric van doon so eric van doon studied these what are called these birth death processes with arrival rates which dependent on the state right so in the mean field limit what we get are birth death type models where the arrival rates lambda are functions so lambda when the state is n is a function of pn which is the stationary distribution of the system so it is a state dependent so so it's, it's a non linear markov process right because the p of n which you are searching for is in the uh, uh is in the arrival rate of this birth death process so it's a non linear birth death process and uh so eric von doon had studied a lot, a lot of uh, stuff and in fact these type of things are very useful in the type of results that i showed today i i didn't go through all the technical stuff but uh, you know that's what is really involved yeah th this is the technique that the russians also currently develop right i mean the yeah. uh, senior shot this non linear uh, markov theory right exactly uh, on the on, on uh, uh on on the measures right so uh exactly. the space of measures because pn yeah. is the space of measures right PN yeah right the measure yeah mm. yeah it's very powerful i mean to, to prove the tightness in the things like that yeah mm. so so i think that the, the challenge is these problems is more the technicalities you get a feel very easily but after that you have to do the hard work yeah mm. and i wanted to give this talk just to show that you know a lot of these problems you can do the hard work it's just uh, it's just very technical okay thank you oh there are questions so thank you again ali for your presentation okay and thanks and i i hope uh, after may if i come through I hope to see you some of you in person.